Uh, good evening, everyone. On behalf of MK Global Financial Services, I welcome you all for Q4 and FI22 results conference call of Aishar Motors. We thank management for giving us the opportunity. Management team is management team is represented by uh, Mr. Siddharth Lal, MD and CEO Aishar Motors, Mr. Vinod Agarwal. MD and CEO, V Commercial Vehicles, Mr. B. Govind Rajan, CEO, Royal Enfield and Whole Time Director, Mr. Kalishwaran Arunachalam, CFO. We request management for opening remarks, which can be followed by Q&A session. Uh, over to you, Siddharth, sir. Hello and good evening, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. And welcome to Aisha Motors Limited earning call for the quarter ended March 31st, 2022, and for the financial year 2021 22. The year that's gone by was extremely significant for Aisha Motors Limited as we registered considerable progress towards our long term goals, and despite numerous headwinds through the year. Since we began uh, expanding our business into international markets six, eight years ago, it has been our ambition to sustainably grow our overseas presence and to become a premium global consumer brand from India. This year, we made really strong progress towards unlocking your opportunities in these markets, led by expansion of our international footprint and commencement of operations in key markets. And all of this contributed to a stellar growth of 108% year on year in our international markets. Uh, Govind, could you be on mute, please? We've also added two new local assembly units this year in Colombia and in Thailand, which are very important markets for us. In India, we've continued to define the middle weight segment. Yes, the middle weight segment. And we've performed consistently as compared to the other, compared to industry, despite enormous supply chain challenges stemming largely from shortage of semiconductor chips, even though there were lots of other supply chain challenges last year, including huge inflation and unavailability of other commodities as well. In FI22, while our over mar overall market share remains steady, uh, we grew at around 5.8%. We actually closed quarter four with over 7% market share. And that's in the overall motorcycle industry in India. So of all motorcycles sold, we were 7%. And we have increased to 28.7. That's a 2.8% increase in market share in all motorcycles, 125 cc and above. So if you think about it, I think in the last quarter it was above 30%. The are above 125 cc market share. So basically, one out of every three motorcycles sold above 125 cc. And we're not even present in below 250. So above 125cc in India is a Royal Enfield. And of course, we continue, despite enormous uh, number of manufacturers and new models coming into the above 250cc space, we, we continue to dominate that with a, around 90% market share in the above 250cc space despite all the global and Indian manufacturers entering into that space in a big way in the last many years. Since its launch in 2008, the Royal Enfield Classic, as you all know, has become the most popular motorcycle within our portfolio. And this year, we achieved a critical milestone with the transition of the Classic to the all-new J-Series platform. We launched this across all our global markets, and the new motorcycle has received 
absolutely amazing reviews from experts and the writing community across the world. This was one of the biggest challenges of the last decade for Royal Enfield to switch over from a running platform where we had uh, our most important motorcycle to switch it over. And it's absolutely amazing the motorcycle and the switch over we were able to do. And, and despite all the challenges of supply chain, we were still able to um, get the production and everything else going. So it's been an enormous change management. And now we're on this really, really solid footing moving forward. Mm. Also, creating niche riding cultures and subcategories has been a key focus for us. With the Himalayan, we were able to build a unique subculture of accessible adventure touring across the communities. And we cemented that proposition in an effort to build inroads in the adventure category. In order to do that, we launched the Scram 411 which is our first adventure tour crossover motorcycle. So we launched that this year or uh, just a few months ago. Scram also has received great response from consumers, and we're now taking this to international markets as well. On the commercial vehicles front, the domestic commercial vehicle segment charted a sharp recovery in FI22, and VCV clocked a 38% year-on-year growth in volumes. We successfully launched a wide range of Aisha trucks and buses and variants for India and export markets. We established the brand new Volvo FM and FMX truck range and delivered the first synergies from the successful integration of Volvo buses that we bought recently from Volvo Group into VCV. We maintained our market share across light me medium and heavy duty segments of around 30% in light and medium duty trucks and 7% in heavy duty trucks and continue to retain retain a profitability and the only profitable commercial vehicle company last year, as you all would know. So, um, so that's also a big, I think, feather in our cap and testament to our uh, management and to our business model that we're able to accomplish profitability when all our big competitors are uh, making losses. The board of directors of Aisha Motors Limited at the meeting held earlier today declared the final dividend of rupees 21 per share for the year 2021-22, implying a payout sum of rupees 574 crores. As we move forward, we're committed to align the next stage of our growth with the renewed and much stronger ESG vision that we have, with the disruptive effects of the pandemic receding and a very strong product pipeline and distribution in place, we're confident to push forward on our strategic plans and long-term product and business objectives. Now, moving to financials for the fourth quarter and the financial year. Consolidating financials, for the quarter and financial year ended March 2021. <clears throat> the revenue for Q4, we had our highest ever quarterly revenue actually in Q4 at 3,193 crores, up 8.6 from 2,940 crores last year. For the whole year, we had our highest ever annual revenue at 10,298 crores, up 18.1% from last year. Our EBITDA for Q4 was at 757 crores, up 19.3% from last year, uh, same quarter. And for the full year, we had 2,172 crores, up 22% from whole of last year. Our EBITDA margin has also climbed up. So for the quarter, is 23.7% against 21.6% last year, um, which is a 2.1% year-on-year increase. And despite a 10% drop in volume from last year, right? Um, And for financial year, we're at 21.1% against 20.4% last year. Overall, our profit after tax for Q4 is 610 crores, up 16%. For the full year, it's at 1,677 crores, 
up 24.5%. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. I will now hand over to Govind Rajan, who is the new CEO of Royal Enfield. Congratulations, Govind, on the new position. I'm sure you'll do an outstanding job, considering you've been here for 23 years and and been doing an outstanding job for all these years. So uh, looking forward to your leadership and running of Royal Enfield, Govind, and over to you. Thank you, Sajada. Hi, everyone. Uh, we have a small uh, technical glitch, not able to switch on our video. So excuse us for that. Uh, as the audio is, hope it is clear. I'm just checking whether the audio is okay. So. All good, Govin. Loud and clear. It's okay. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Hope everyone are doing well. At Royal Enfield, we strongly committed to and remain steadfast on our long-term goals. This year, we registered our highest ever annual revenues, backed by the efforts made over the last six years across the business. We registered significant growth in overseas market, you all know, with about 108% growth in sales numbers and about 105% growth on the revenue term. This is marked by an improvement in the non-motorcycle business with a 45% increase in the sales year on year. Now, let me share with you some of the key highlights for Q4 of the financial year 21-22 and full year 21-22. Let me just begin with the sales volume for Q4. Royal Enfield had sold 1,82,125 motorcycles, which is down by about 10.4%, from 2,3343 last year. Notwithstanding the constraints around the supply chain because of the semiconductor chips, we steadily improved our performance, which is about plus 8.6%, supported by an onboarding of alternate suppliers, uh, that entire ecosystem which has been brought in to minimize the impact of the shortages. Our demand, it's continued to stay resilient, further aided by the launch of Scram 411, as that was mentioning. Uh, Scram 411, which has received an excellent customer response in India, while our volumes remain 15.5% below Q4, we have increased our market share in the motorcycle segment of more than 125cc engine by 5% to 32.9% as compared to 28.1% in Q4 FI21. For the full year 22, total sales to that 5,95,474 motorcycles down by 2.3%, almost same like last year. Uh, we had a lot of challenges in the supply chain on the production front, but as I mentioned, mentioned the demand for our motorcycles remains very resilient. Our market share in the motorcycle segment of more than 125cc engine uh, increased by about 2.8% to about 28.7% in the full year. Our international market, as I mentioned, we continued our strong growth momentum. Uh, we registered the highest ever quarterly sale in Q4. We sold 21,787 motorcycles which is double almost compared to the previous year, which is almost a growth of 59.2%. For the full year, the international business volume is doubled to about 74,238 motorcycles versus 35,700 motorcycles. Uh, it's a, all around every market where we have entered. It has been a tremendous growth, which we are seeing. In all the markets where we entered, especially in Europe, we have achieved about 7% market share in the mid-size motorcycles. In the Americas, we have achieved about 5% market share. And in the APAC region, we have crossed 7% market share in the mid-size segments. In all the markets where we are entering, we are steadily seeing the growth outside India too. This is backed by the network expansion and firming up our commitment to the international markets. We have added during this period about 33 exclusive stores and about 44 multi-brand outlets across region this year. We have also commenced our operations at our CKD facilities in Colombia and Thailand, Argentina, which was done last year. During this year, we did for Colombia and Thailand, in addition to the facility in Argentina, as I mentioned. Uh, in the CKD facilities, we have almost assembled 5,000 plus units. Uh, our domestic network footprint stands at, as of date, about 2,118 stores. Office 1063 is a dealership format, 
and 1055 so studio stores at the end of the financial year. Um, our non motorcycling business, it has continued to grow steadily. Uh, our constant endeavor to deepen riders' engagement with his or her motorcycle, which has resulted in growth of our genuine motorcycle accessories and sparse verticals. We witnessed a growth of almost about 45% year on year in this year. The total non motorcycle revenue for the business is currently standing around 15% of the overall revenue. On new product interactions, just to give you a background, what all the things which has been done, we have introduced two new exciting motorcycles this year. One is the all new Royal Enfield Classic 350 and the Scram 411. Reborn on the new J series engine platform, the all new Classic 350, which has received an excellent response from all the experts and the consumers alike and has won numerous awards and accolades globally. The Scram 411, the brand's first adventure crossover, was launched to great reception from consumers and experts. At the EGMA 2021, we showcased the SG650 concept, the new retro interpretation that pushes the boundaries of what Royal Enfield motorcycle could look like. A host of landmark initiatives marked by Royal Enfield's 120th year anniversary this year, one is 90 degrees south, a daring expedition that saw two of the Royal Enfield Himalayans accomplish the unthinkable feat of traversing the treacherous journey to the South Pole. Two of our company employees successfully completed this expedition in 28 days in December 2021. We also debuted the 120th year anniversary edition of the brand flagship 650 motorcycle, the Interceptor 650 and the Continental 650 at IGMA 2021. The motorcycles received an incredible response in India as well as Europe, and all of them got sold within about 120 seconds. This year, Royal Enfield marked its maiden foray in the world of modern motorsports with the Continental GT Cup 2021, with a focus on building accessible inroads for young enthusiasts into the motorsports and retro racing. The first season of the GT Cup was conducted at the Curry Motor Speedway and Racetrack amidst the fanfare and resounding response from all the young riders. Strengthening our association with the armed forces, we partnered with the Border Security Force for one of its kind all women Seema Bhavani Surya expedition. The expedition saw about 36 women riders traversed 5,200 kilometers across the country uh, on our classic motorcycle 350, which focused to build awareness about freedom and bias and stereotypes against women. And the whole journey ended at Royal Enfield factory. Further strengthening the pure motorcycling ecosystem, we initiated collaborations with iconic motorcycle lifestyle brands TCX and Bell Staff. The TCX Association saw the two brands collaborate to create C certified protective riding and lifestyle shoes. The association with Bell Staff saw the launch of a range of lifestyle and protective apparel. To conclude, the consumer preference for personal mobility and premiumization continues to drive the demand for the segment and for our products. As supply chain constraints gradually ease out, we expect production to scale up further. With a slew of new launches planned in the near term and midterm, we are excited about what is in store for us globally. That's it from the Royal Enfield side. Now I'll request Mr. Vinod Agarwal to take you through the VCB performance and updates. Over to you, Vinod. Very good evening uh, to everyone. And uh, I'll take you through uh, about VCV performance and also give you a little bit about the CV industry. Uh, as far as the performance is concerned, I think uh, last year was a very, very challenging year. But in spite of uh, that challenging year, I think uh, as Siddharth mentioned in his opening remarks, uh, we had good growth. Uh, both in volume terms as well as in value terms. Uh, in value terms, we have a growth of 47% for the full year. In fact, uh, last year has been our all-time high top line of 12,724 crores uh, as against 8,676 crores in the year before. 
so it's it's all time high even though the volume wise it is 57000 plus and uh, as you know earlier peak was close to 73000 in year 1890 so while while in volume terms we are much lower than the earlier peak but in value terms we have crossed the earlier peak uh, as far as the vida margins and the profitability is concerned uh, i think the, the there were a lot of challenges last year starting with very high inflation and uh, then very high level of uh, discounting and uh, then supply chain challenges uh, so in spite of all this uh, good thing is that we have overall for the full year we have remained uh, profitable and uh, for our uh, full year uh, we have a on consolidated vcb basis we have a pat of 108 crores uh which of course uh, is against 63 crores in the year before in 2021 and uh, as far as uh, the margin is concerned uh, for the full year uh, for the full year we have a vida of uh, 5.6% as against 6.8% last year so since the last year the top line was much lower the margins were better so in spite of uh, the top line going up the margins have dropped as i mentioned earlier due to very high inflation and inability of the industry to pass on the cost increases uh, even though we could make up a lot through cost reductions and uh, and also uh, there were some losses due to the supply chain challenges and uh, then of course uh, as far as the market shares are concerned uh, i think we have done uh, very well uh, we have a market share of in 5 to 16 ton segment we have a market share of 30.2% as against 30.6% uh, a year before uh, in buses we have improved in fact uh, significantly in market shares uh, from 19.9% to 21.6% even though the bus market uh, still is very very low uh, in heavy duty trucks uh, our market share is Uh, at 7.3 percent against 7.9 percent last year, so there was uh, some uh, you know uh, lower market share because of very high uh, discounting which were there in the market, and of course beyond a point we decided not to uh, run after the market share. That's why you see that overall we have remained profitable, uh, whereas I think uh, for nine months and now we also have the results of Tata Motors for full year for full year. they are still on on loss in spite of selling very high volume uh, so therefore uh, uh, i think uh, uh, considering the difficult situation in the market i would say we are uh, we have done reasonably well uh, as far as the new product lines are concerned i think the we are the ones uh, which led the migration to cng alternate fuel and uh, we have now almost Uh, 34% market share in the uh, entire cng market and uh, and then apart from that uh, full year we introduced quite a few quite a few new products and uh, this was the entire range of cng products then of course uh, various variants in heavy duty trucks and in light and medium duty trucks and uh, various new export uh, products overall we introduced uh, almost 66 new products last year which included 25 in light and medium duty 16 in heavy duty 7 in buses and uh, we have introduced intercity coach uh, in buses which is now manufactured in volvo bus plant in hoskote so this is the first fruit of our uh, synergistic working between volvo bus and aisher as you know volvo bus is now part of vcb and uh, and then uh, we also got the uh, cv maker of the year award uh, uh, in the cv apollo awards for our uh, 2114 cng truck and we also got uh, few other uh, awards in the overall in the in that uh, cv apollo uh, apollo awards uh, so overall uh, i would say uh, if you look at the product portfolio if you look at the our industrial capacity if you look at the our processes uh, especially the retail excellence and the network and uh, all other Uh, uh customer linked uh, infrastructure i think we have made significant improvement we are consistently improving in our network and last year we added uh, 
in fact, quite a few new uh, network points in East and Far East and in some of the other unrepresented uh, territories. And we have uh, plans to add more uh, network points even in this year. So therefore, we should get more and more, uh, you know, libres from the expanded distribution footprint. Apart from that, uh, I think we have done a lot of work in digitalization and we have done a lot of work in retail excellence. We measure specific parameters which create customer satisfaction. For example, we measure responsiveness. Uh, we measure uh, the repeat uh, repairs. We measure uh, in how much time our uh, service vans are able to reach uh, if there is a breakdown of a truck on the road. And we are able to give predictive maintenance. Uh, this is the first of its kind in the industry. If the uh, vehicle breaks down, uh, if the vehicle has some problem uh, while it is running on a highway, uh, our uptime center keeps on getting the data consistently, continuously from a running vehicle. And based on the analytics which we have put in our uptime center, if there is any problem with respect to overheating of the engine or uh, oil level is less, that information is immediately known at the uptime center and on real time basis and our uptime center calls up the driver uh, to inform him depending on the seriousness either to stop immediately or we book him in the next service station so by that process we are able to save a lot of engine seizures so so, so what i am trying to say that we have done, initiated a lot of uh, customer facing uh, a new uh, initiatives which are all digitalized and which are uh, very strongly monitored uh, from our side. So therefore, uh, uh, on the company side, we have the products which are technological superior. We have the very wide range of products. And uh, then, of course, we have a very good uh, uh, setup. In, uh, the network is increasing a lot of steps on the retail excellence. And, uh, and then, uh, of course, the industry is... Uh, on the right path now, industry, the, we had three bad years and the industry is improving now and hopefully it should go back to its earlier peak or even cross there. So therefore, I would say we have good plans and if we execute these plans well, uh, I'm sure the company will have good growth potential in future. So then I now invite Siddharth back on this call. Thank you, Vinod, and thank you, Govin. And <clears throat> so now you've heard from both the CEOs on uh, the individual businesses on Royal Enfield and on VCV. And I have to say, I'm absolutely delighted with the absolutely amazing uh, leadership teams that we have at both the businesses. They're really in sync and very focused leadership teams. Um, working super hard. And as you know, we have a very, very strong and resilient business model and capabilities and, and it's really showing up even in, in tough times where the last couple of years, I mean, it doesn't seem like that's a bit, but they've been super tough from many perspectives. And, and you can see it's, uh, we're still thriving in these conditions. And of course, as the markets go up, uh, I'm sure we will do much better because um, we also have, for both the businesses, I can say clearly that we have very, very, very strong product pipelines, um, very good distribution, which is working really well and in sync with our uh, organizational needs. And we're super confident of making the strides and, and the path towards our long-term ambition. So uh, really delighted about how things are going right now and looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you, sir, for the uh, comprehensive opening remarks. Uh, can we start the Q&A session? Uh, Pramod, uh, you can please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Raghu. And uh, congratulations, uh, Govind, and uh, great to see you, Nod, sir, after a long time. Uh, my question is uh, related to uh, the demand, uh, uh, domestic demand scenario, uh, Siddharth. I wouldn't bother you on the exports uh, side. It's going really great. Uh, on the domestic side, uh, thanks to the way the commodity price inflation and the regulatory headwinds have kind of added in, uh, the product has become much, much more pricier. 
uh, across the industry level and especially for you as well because uh, you can't escape the ABS uh, bullet, right? So uh, just trying to understand, given the kind of price leap what we have seen uh, for your products over the last three, four years and the macro where we are, uh, which is not great, uh, upgrade demand definitely kind of suffers uh, and which is kind of visible in your kind of uh, uh, the mind share you have on the category and the kind of uh, market share and there is still gap. So is there any thought on uh, uh, reworking the product or looking at something which can be more accessible from a customer, uh, from a price point, uh, which can probably accelerate the upgrade ladder. Uh, because I'm pretty sure a lot of customers want to buy RE, but the prices have really gone through the roof, uh, right? Uh, and so is there something which the company can do in terms of re-engineering the product uh, or, a, or a new derivative or a brand? Uh, you talked about a product pipeline. So does it include something like that? And if you can just spare your, just share your thoughts on the, uh, the, the upgrade uh, 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 customers, what you're kind of uh, getting into your family every month? So, Pramod, I'll start and maybe Govind can add. As you know, unfortunately, for this situation, we can't or we don't talk about our future product plan, so I can't really unfortunately, I can't help you with that answer. Of course, we do have a very strong pipeline and and we are cognizant of how the costs have been moving and therefore how the prices have been moving. And um, yet we do absolutely believe in in the segment that we're operating in and that we can continue to get upgraders into Royal Enfield Fold. And of course, we're doing lots of different things in order to get upgraders into our fold. We have a very, very strong uh, new thought process and work we've done on, on financing operations as well, not ours, but I'm saying third party, but uh, but on how to get our customers in. So there's a lot of different aspects of work going on, and there's a lot of new bikes that will, you know, that will give a lot of enjoyment to people, and they sh- they'll be willing to pay for it, really. I mean, that's how we're looking at it. But there is uh, certainly interesting things on the horizon, for sure. Maybe, Govind, you want to add something on what Pramodit said? Yeah, and Pramoda, you were you're asking about the demand. How is it going? I mean, just to drill a point which we discussed now, uh, when the market is down by about 18, 20 percent, Royal Enfield has actually gained market share. Now you can see how the love for this Royal Enfield brand is coming up. Uh, you know, gradually the market is bringing into the normalization. Uh, last few months, I've been seeing steadily the volume is growing. Industry is coming back. Uh, Royal Enfield, because, you know, all along we have been seeing in the last six months also our, our bookings have been higher than the retail. Uh, to that extent, what is happening is when the production comes up, then, then obviously there's the numbers which are going to go up. Uh, you had talked about accessible product. Uh, I thought all our products are accessible and very aspirational. Uh, but we are also looking at uh, how do we get more and more in customers who actually love to have the Royal Enfield motorcycle in his uh, stable. For that, we are working on various methodologies of accessibility, how we can give it to the consumers, especially on the finance, uh, which is one big lever. Uh, We have started working on it intensely, where we feel that that will help for the future products wherein young customers can also be brought into our stable. Thanks for that, Govan. Thanks for that. Uh, sir, second question is to Vinod, uh, uh, given that he's on the call today. Uh, on the commercial vehicle industry uh, pricing discipline, sir, because uh, uh, we've seen good growth for the last three years, but uh, for some reason, the pricing doesn't hold up. Uh, 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 so what is your thought on that? And uh, related to that uh, is, is uh, do you see any improvement whatsoever in the pricing discipline in the industry? And uh, also on the EV, some of these tenders which have got uh, uh, floated recently, the bidding by few players seems to be very aggressive. So if you can share your thoughts uh, on the viability of such, uh, uh, such, such bids which have been uh, kind of uh, 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 or or, or Companies which have kind of bid like that, is there, is there a really viable business model there on EVs? Thank you. First on the pricing front, uh, I think uh, definitely currently this is a major challenge uh, that we are not able to pass on the price increases because of the competitive pressures. Uh, at the same time, uh, I think it cannot continue like this because uh, I'm sure a better sense will prevail. and uh, and once the capacity utilizations improve, uh, now the CV industry is on the recovery path. Uh, once you reach nearing your capacities, 
I think uh, there won't be any incentive to continue giving uh, big discounts. Uh, so therefore, uh, that is one, one part of it. The second is uh, we have to create more and more awareness with the customers that they should not look at the initial price. They have to look at the overall cost of ownership. If you look at the overall cost of ownership, the price plays only part to the extent of maybe 20% of the cost of ownership. 50 to 60% is the fuel economy and around 15 to 20% is the tire life. So if we are able to save costs for the customer on fuel side and on the tire side, um, I think the cost of acquisition, even if they pay 5 to 10% premium, it doesn't matter because even if you pay 10% premium, it is only 2% of 20%. Whereas if you save 10% of fuel, then you save uh, 5% of, out of 50%. So therefore, our drive has to be uh, to, to show the value to the customer. And we are right now working very, very seriously that in case there is any leakage in this value, uh, that is what we are plugging in. And that is where the customer service is going to play a very, very important role. And we are working very seriously to improve uh, you know, on various parameters of customer service. And we are delivering a great value as far as uh, through the digitalization initiatives and through connected trucks. As you know, we are now giving 100% trucks and buses as connected. And we make the connection live and give it for two years. And then customer, we are able to show him the value through a very powerful app, which we have put on the uh, thousands of customers' uh, smartphones. And we are also able to give predictive maintenance to that. So therefore, I'm not too much worried in the long run as far as the discounting is concerned. This is a short-term phenomena. It has to die one day. It will, it will die. And then, of course, that is the time when the companies like us will get into the major advantage mode. Uh, as far as the electric vehicles are concerned, uh, I think uh, it's the beginning. Uh, the industry is evolving. And, uh, of course, the current uh, CESL tender, you know, which has been allotted now, which has been decided, uh, the prices, of course, it, it is beyond our understanding because there was a difference of almost 20% from the L1 and L2. So between L1 and L2, I have never seen the huge difference like this, uh, which is almost 20%. So we have to understand uh, that what is the uh, motivation to uh, you know, take on the orders uh, at such a low price. And we should not forget, uh, this is going to be very, very tough business because uh, whatever uh, tenders you are picking up, you have to, uh, this entire model is on per kilometer basis. And you are committing for next 12 years. Whatever rates you are giving, you are fixing the rate for next 12 years. And uh, then you have to deliver uptime and you have to deliver uh, everything uh, in next 12 years. So therefore, if you are taking a hit in per kilometer, it means you are going to suffer consistently for next, next 12 years. So, of course, we will never do that sort of a thing where we are, we are very clear that we will incur loss because we don't want to become loss leaders. But the industry will evolve. There will be more opportunities coming on the electric vehicles. It is just first tender which has come. Uh, now it was government incentive-based tender under frame two. More tenders will come, which will, which will be outside the frame and which will be for private uh, contracts. Because this right now 5,000 buses, this is all for government uh, STUs. Now the, you will see more and more action happening in the private space in various intercity routes or various intercity routes. I think uh, we are ready with the technology, we are ready with the products. So therefore, uh, we are for a long run and we are not going to, you know, uh, give discounts in the short run. Thank you, sir. Next, uh, can we have a question from Jinesh Gandhi? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question. A uh, couple of questions. One is, uh, what are we seeing on the commodity side uh, uh, now? Uh, what are the pressures seen in the fourth quarter and what kind of pressures do you expect in the uh, upcoming first quarter? And the second question on the other expenses, uh, which continue to remain high. I believe last quarter we had some uh, event-related expenses, uh, but despite that, we have seen further increase in uh, this quarter. So how should we uh, see through uh, the other expenses line item? Thanks. Sure. Uh, thanks, Janesh. I think... Uh, uh, Overall, from a commodity perspective, uh, the headwinds uh, continue. 
as you would have seen now, uh, we we all thought around Q4, maybe the beginning of Q4, it can settle in, but then there was the geopolitical disruption, which is further adding to the commodity pressure that we are seeing in. Uh, at this point of time, uh, we need to wait and watch. There is no uh, clarity as to when will this stabilize. Uh, base metals have started to increase. That is where the uh, significant pressure is coming in. More or less, precious group of metals went up and that is coming back. So that is happening, but base metals continue to increase. So we need to wait for at least a quarter or two to see where does this stabilize and do we see a fundamental correction happening after the super commodity cycle. But at this point of time, too early to conclude. Now, coming to your uh, second question uh, in terms of the other expenditure, I would love to look at this in two parts. One is if I have to compare this to FI20, our full year other expenditure was about roughly 1,200 crores. That in FI22 stands at 1,400 crores. Now, if I have to look at the delta of what is driving this increase, one part of this is significantly on account of the freight increases that has happened. You have seen our export business. We have almost doubled the business, reaching about 67,000 units per full year. That also means there is one, availability of container is becoming a challenge. And whatever container is available is at an extremely premium cost. We are seeing about 6x increase in terms of uh, the overall uh, freight cost that is on the international side. So volume increase on international coupled with the container cost increase is one reason for other expenditure to go up, which we expect it to continue in terms of the future also. But overall, the model mix at international at net of all the cost is still accredited to the bottom line. Second, yes, we did invest uh, in some of the launches that we talked about in the uh, earlier uh, quarters, uh, which had the uh, classic and it also had the uh, trip to South Pole. Uh, so while those are milestone based events that happens, uh, but we would love to continue to invest in the brand and ensure that the aspiration uh, gets balanced with accessibility. So that's probably the way forward I would see as to how do you need to look at the other expenditure. Just to add on, uh, Dinesh, on the commodity side, as because it's a super inflation which is continuing now, what is that we have to do as an organization? Our focus is very intense. Uh, we have commissioned our value engineering uh, VAV initiatives with our team, dedicated people who are put onto the job. Uh, we have done as a team uh, of mining out what are the options which are there in reducing uh, the precious metal. And that activity is continuously going on uh, without disturbing any of the right handling, which is very important for us. Uh, we are also started looking at digitization of some of the activities, thereby the activities which is endlessly adding some cost can get automated. So internally, we are also looking at how do we edge all these sort of issues, which we don't have a control on. But we are very focused. We are seized of the issues. And the team is fully on the job, uh, Janesh. Oh, thanks. And one last question on exports. So given that uh, that has been uh, doing extremely well for us, uh, 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 we now have broadly good presence in most of the important markets which we are targeting. Uh, over next couple of years, uh, which are the key markets where we would be looking to ramp up uh, our presence uh, with respect to both in terms of uh, the distribution network and in terms of volumes? Thanks. Yeah, Janesh, I think, uh, you know, the international market, in our opinion, uh, it's a starting point for uh, Royal Enfield success. Uh, we have launched our Classic 350, which is which is also an outstanding product, which got received very well across the globe. This is an Euro 5 uh, compliant vehicle. We launched Scram. All these vehicle launches which had come in, so for us, it is just a starting point. As of now, uh, the markets like Europe, uh, North America, LATAM, uh, and the EPAC regions, all those areas, as I mentioned, the market share has been steadily growing. Uh, and some of the areas where we have decided to be there in that market through the CKD route, uh, thereby our presence is there and you know, that's how the consumers are actually relate to that. They are part of us. Like we live the life of the consumers in those countries. And uh, that's why we see the growth in the international market is going to be very huge. Um, as of now, uh, we are, we are actually sending motorcycles which are manufactured in India to almost 60 plus countries. And wherever our consumers are in love uh, of those motorcycles, we will look at that uh, on priority basis and we will enter into the market. Yeah, just to add a little bit um, on the markets, as it were, um, EU is huge for us, and I think it can. We believe it can grow tremendously in the coming 
years or decades. So Europe is uh, absolutely enormous and, and we love our motorcycles. Um, so it, it just works out really well. Um, in North America, um, similar, but maybe a step behind right now. So um, we're building further distribution. So we're really penetrating now deep into EU, deep into North America. So in all the developing countries, which means Australia, New Zealand, we have a great brand equity and people love our new mo- our motorcycles. Japan, uh, Korea, all these developed countries are doing well. Then, um, again, further depth, let's say, in uh, the core LATAM and, um, and APAC markets, that's still a longer story, let's call it. So it's, it's working out. It's got huge potential in the medium long term. We're doing well. We've got brand salience. We've got distributors are doing well. Dealers are doing well. Sorry, all of that. So it's actually a lot more depth, but we keep adding a market here, a market there to test different situations, conditions. We've added something in Morocco recently. Again, just to, uh, to get a feel of what different markets may be like. We're approaching some markets in a different way. We're doing only some B2B transactions in some markets for tour operators just to sort of see how we operate in those markets before we actually start putting in a distribution. So there's, you know, so we're testing those kind of things in Africa, for example, because we don't want to, we can't be in the taxi market. We have no interest in that market, which is really the core for other play, Indian players who are in Africa. But we, we have other ideas, thoughts, means, and not the typical fashion. But we are expanding, but in different ways now in different countries. Uh, thank you, sir. Next, can we have Sonal Gupta? Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, good evening and thanks for my, taking my question. Uh, just continuing uh, with the previous question, could you just sort of give some more details in terms of what's the broad split of exports in terms of EU, Americas, and um, LATAM and APAC? And uh, could you also talk about, like, you've been in Thailand, now you're setting up an assembly plant, uh, and also in Colombia for uh, quite a few years now, four or five years. So uh, where have you reached in terms of, uh, market share or scale, uh, and how large are these markets? If you could just talk about those. Yeah, go on. Yeah. So, uh, starting with, uh, from a region priority, if you look at it, uh, the large part of our business, as said, uh, started with comes from EU. Close to about, uh, 40 percentage of our business, uh, comes from the EU market, followed by Americas, which includes Latin America, which is roughly about, uh, say, 25, 30 percent. And then the balance comes from uh, Asia Pacific. So uh, let's start with uh, Thailand. Thailand as a market, yes, I think we see uh, significant potential as a market, not only Thailand, but also the entire uh, Southeast Asia for that matter. So we started with uh, our, our penetration into Thailand with our uh, stores, followed it up now with the CKD. And we do see the market growing up and our market share is inching towards 7-8 percentage already in the uh, Asia Pacific region. Now, <clears throat> On the Latin America side, there are two parts to it. One, Brazil, which continues to be a significant opportunity for us in terms of uh, the revenue deliverability. But the country has its own challenges in terms of uh, forex or in terms of the tax structure it has got. So we need to balance it out and appropriate time take calls as to what kind of setup will make it uh, accurate for us as we grow forward. Uh, Colombia, Mexico, we have already, uh, sorry, Colombia and Argentina, we have already started our CKD plant. Uh, business is delivering uh, very, very well uh, for us. Between Latin America, if I have to look at a run rate, including Brazil, we should be doing roughly about, say, a 20 percentage of our exports coming from that market. Uh, go with you, no, it's yeah. fine. Yeah. Because of time also. Yeah, yeah. thanks a lot. Thank you. Next, can we have Kapil Singh? Good evening, sir. Uh, firstly, wanted an update on the uh, supply situation. What is the percentage production you are losing currently uh, compared to the required run rate? And we had talked about several actions to address this problem. So what is the update on that? Yeah, Kapil, um, what is happening uh, now is, as I mentioned, as is 100% ABS motorcycles. To that extent, the e-component, especially the semiconductor issue, which was there. Uh, last year, we were losing production, fundamentally because we had only one source. But over the year, we swiftly uh, brought in uh, 
to more vendors, uh, thereby the supply is increased. Just for everybody's understanding, the overall capacity of, let alone for us, for the entire automotive, it will be kicking in from first quarter of 2023. That's what it is being said. But what we have approached as an initiative is that we shouldn't lose the production. So we have gone ahead with the various levels of purchase, inventorization to some extent, uh, alternative sourcing additions. So wherever possible, the supply chain volatility, which is there because of the current pandemic situations, are deemed as on the job of actually maximizing uh, the potential which is available for us. Uh, so are we losing our production right now or uh, you think it is uh, more or less at the levels at which we want it to be? We have steadily ramping up, Kapil, steadily ramping up um, to the market, whatever is required. We have actually come out with what is called as an SNOP new process, which we have added into this so that the consumers are continuously connected into this. Uh, we are working very closely with all the suppliers so that we don't lose any productions so that efficiency is also maintained. So it's a constant growth, uh, which I'm just seeing uh, now. Okay, great. Uh, Kalish, one follow-up to you, please. Uh, the other expenses should we look at as a percentage of sales? Uh, it has been holding around 12 to 13%. So is that the right level to expect given your international expansions? That's right, Kapil. I think at this point of time, uh, we should uh, take it at that level, considering there are growth aspirations plus brand building uh, aspirations that will continue via marketing investments also. Okay. Thank you. I'll follow up in the queue. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, given the paucity of time, uh, that was the last question. Uh, please note the IR team and management will be available offline to answer any questions. I now hand over to the management for closing remarks, please. Well, thank you all very much for attending and uh, looking forward to talking to you and seeing you in a bit next quarter. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. You. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Raghu. Thank you. Yes, sir.